Today is Saturday, June 29, 2019. It's about 8.35 a.m. here in Los Angeles. I wanted to record this video and try to give a basic uh, timeline of how we got here, why this idea happened, and what's happening now, and what to expect next. I haven't done one of these in a while. I felt appropriate to do it today so uh, I apologize for the lighting and other elements here I'm not Ace and Zach this is not my trade so if it's a little bit off apologies for that um, some of you are gonna know this story uh, I think most of you don't uh, how did it how did this idea come about um, you know where did it come from in the uh, late 90s uh, Ace and I moved to Costa Rica to help a friend build a sports book software company um, anybody who remembers that period remembers that that was the offshore gambling boom. And that's really when um, the sports industry recognized the size of the online gambling market is in the period from about 1999 through, I would say, the early 2001, 2002. So um, I had not had any experience with sports betting. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. Um, I've still to this day never placed a sports bet. It's not my thing. But um, building a, helping a friend build a business, um, I, it sounded intriguing, so um, that's what, what Ace and I did. Went down there to do that. So in that process, um, realized the size of the marketplace, um, appetite for it, sports gambling, even though it was offshore and basically unregulated, didn't seem to matter. It was just absolutely crazy how many uh, people were involved and how much money they were willing to risk. Um, so that was how I even discovered um, the, the, the marketplace. Now I had had some stock um, day trading experience just playing around in the late 90s. So um, it, was, it was that that gave me the idea of a sports stock market concept. Um, that in the understanding of how sports gambling operators maximize their profits, which is basically intricate trickery, uh, mathematical trickery, and I was not comfortable with that, so um, there was a basic flaw in the morality, if you want to call it, for me, and I had to back away. I can't participate in something that I don't believe in. So that became the genesis of the sports stock market concept which we, um, I, I outlined the design and then Ace wrote the code and that's been the case to this day. Um, we put the beta up in 2003, the design process was 2001, 2002, uh, 2003 was the beta and this was again in Costa Rica and then 2004 was the launch. So uh, it launched in, in August of 2004 and it took off like a rocket, uh, much quicker than I expected. Uh, it was definitely a, a concept that the public, um, anybody who saw it, grasped pretty quickly and was intrigued by. Um, we so that's that that happened, and then it created a decision point. And that decision point was: Do we continue to run this as an offshore? Gam basically gambling alternative or do we seek regulation and put the resources into that so there was quite a bit of controversy about that anybody who was around at the time will remember that um, I was not going to be part of anything that would not pursue legality all the way um, some fights broke out but at the end of the day the resources went towards regulation and we took it down that path and that's how I ended up uh, in Washington with various contacts and meetings and working through all that. So in that process we um, discovered that the condition of the law back then uh, we couldn't, we were unable to get a safe legal opinion on on our platform regardless of whether or not it was, you know, basically there was no safe place to put it because the gambling laws at the time were were clear and under the best of circumstances, there was no way to configure it in a way that the Justice Department may not act against us and call us an offshore gambling outfit. So uh, through the recommendation of, of Sharon Brown, um, who's, who's now the Chief Economist at the State Department, we developed an alternative product, which is the Sports Risk Index. 
and it was supposed to uh, proxy, well, pro it proxies for the value of the teams, but it was a safe uh, alternative to the ASM model that everyone felt would be okay to put online. Um, so we created a, a, a parallel product and then began pursuing how to get that product licensed and instead of building, putting it on the ASM exchange, we, we were connecting up with an existing exchange through a license agreement. So that was 2005, uh, 2006, 2007. So again, the births, 2004, 2005, 6, 7 is regulation. That's when the economy started to get wobbly. Um, about 2000, early 2007, I could tell something was going wrong, but I thought we would be able to um, to outrun it, frankly. Uh, I thought we'd be able to outrun it. Uh, and we didn't, uh, obviously. But so, so what happened is 2007, um, we put together the license, putting together the license agreement. It was with United States Futures Exchange. And then um, I moved to Texas uh, with the purpose of just having uh, any place in the U.S. I picked Texas because uh, I have friends and relatives close by. It's a relatively inexpensive place this being a, um, a vir, you know, virtual uh, web-based company didn't really matter, but what mattered was that I was physically on the ground and the team was physically on the ground in the U.S. because trying to get people to believe you that you're um, putting together a regulated stock market when you're in the jungle, uh, it was a really, really tough sell to just about everybody. Um, regulators, uh, consultants, potential investors, so the decision was made. So we, we moved to, to Texas in um, June of 2008, and then the, um, we were in the final stages of putting together the, the license agreement and the, the, actually the launch list, the task list. I was going through the checklist with uh, the general counsel of United States Futures Exchange, uh, going through that checklist, and then in December, specifically I think December 21st, 22nd, um, the entire world imploded, United States Futures Exchange went bankrupt unexpectedly, and that um, just completely obliterated everything, at least started the process of trying to destroy everything. And it was, um, frankly, it was an experience, thinking back on it now, I'm not really sure how we survived it um, at all with anything, because it was a non-stop onslaught of uh, lawsuits and slanderous accusations and you know friends turning into foes and it was uh, shocking actually I, I mean to this day I'm still blown away when I think back on all of that stuff so um, but I, I was given well I was put in a position where there was a decision to be made either we would um, drop it you know and bankrupt everything I had uh, friends, family, very close family, as in my wife, uh, former wife, and I would lay most of the charge of the reason things came apart on me not willing to give up on this. Um, you know, I mean, it was a fork in the road. Either you quit and throw it all away or, or keep going. And I just couldn't, I couldn't part with the idea, not because I'm stubborn, but because I had made the promise to everybody that I would do everything that I could to see this through and I really felt that there were more things that I could have done and I hadn't done yet so uh, you know I wasn't ready to give up you know the determination in me and just knowing it was a good idea I saw it work uh, I knew we were on the right track and then we got sidelined by a situation that I thought would end relatively soon. Even you know, I've seen several economic downturns in the U.S. in my lifetime, and they usually last, uh, you know, six months, a year, 18 months. Well, that didn't happen in this case. In fact, I would say we're still digging our way out of it, uh, even 10 years later. So um, anyway, so I didn't want to give up on it. Um, I said, you know, let's reset, take a really close look at what we have to maintain to stay alive mainly just uh, keep the IP packages from going dormant, losing the patent applications and all that stuff because that's the core of everything, and then just wait it out. Um, little did I know it was going to take about five years to do that, uh, to even begin to dig out. So from, 
from 2009. So the crash happens in, in uh, 2008, uh, and then from 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So that's what five years there. Only thing, first of all, everybody ran for the hills. Uh, all the people that were supposedly right alongside me and gonna, yeah, that didn't happen. Uh, but a handful of people did stick around, and they they were struggling with their own difficulties with the the economy and the crash, and everybody had something happen to them. But that core group stayed together. Um, some, uh, most of them, you've well, all of them, all of that core team you hear on the calls. And not all the people on the calls now were there, but the core core team, um, which was namely Alper, Neil Brown, uh, and Paul, uh, were always there. Uh, in fact, Neil was the first guy in when the fire broke out. So we um, we st stuck together. We it was a very lonely journey through the woods, uh, through the wilderness for five years. Nobody around, nobody paying any attention. Um, I I was forced to make decisions that I've never had to make before. Quite literally, do I pay for the electricity bill? Do I pay for groceries? Um, that's no joke. Um, I lived in a house that was completely empty of furniture except for the room that I was in. All that stuff went with my ex-wife and I said, take it, I don't care. Um, I had to fight the bank to uh, get them to do the law, follow the law and allow me to modify the mortgage. Um, had to fight them without an attorney. Um, I was left to defend myself against claims like fr from the liar Seth Leon. Sorry, Seth, you are a liar. I'm going to say that till the day I die. Um, I never got to defend that um, lawsuit directly the claims it was default because I was left uh, basically defenseless including by my company attorney and you know so I had I wasn't even able to defend it on the merits all that being said that actually turned into something that we made into a positive for for making the case for ASM but at the time it was just one nightmare after another and um, not a friend to be found, or at least a handful of friends to be found, everybody else running for the hills. Um, but even with all that, for five years, okay, you need to get this, for five straight years, it was nothing but um, managing nightmares and holding on to the pieces that uh, we had to hold on to have something. So that's 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then on about 14, um, is when I was re-engaged. So when you look at the timeline of ASM, it's not fair to draw the timeline all the way back to 1999-2000 because the truth is we were, we were in, we had product launch in, in 2004 and we were at license agreement less than four years later and then the economy crashed and wiped it, almost nearly wiped everything out and then it was a five-year gap where basically nothing happened other than just basic maintenance of the the IP package and not not losing that and then picking it up again um, the clock starts again I would say to be fair in 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 2014 somewhere I think about in the middle is when um, through Neil Neil's contact with Ace we re-engaged and he asked me how do we rebuild it and so there we go so this the clock really starts at 2014 for the current um, where we are now. So that's roughly about five years to this moment. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think it's fair to draw the line all the way back and say this is 20 years trying to get the same thing to work because the people that are seeing it now didn't even see it before. Um, and it's a little different than it was the first time. And, and of course the environment has changed considerably with regulation and gambling um, becoming more accepted. Again, gambling is not illegal, it's not legal in the United States. That is a complete lie. The, the Federal Wire Act is still in place, and it's a state's, uh, state's, state decision one by one, but there's less than 10 that have legalized it, and some of those 10 have, it's pretty crippled up in the way that it's been done. So that's a lie in the marketplace. Sports gambling is not legal in the United States, no matter what anybody says. It's just not. A um, question of whether we have laws or not, or we're going to enforce those laws is a completely different question. But by the numbers, it's not. Um, but what it's done is it's made it easier for us to make our case because one of the things that would have happened is um, we would be compared to that and before I could even explain or even start to explain the conversation would be shut down. That was it. Okay, it was this is gambling, it's no good and I don't get that now because because the conditions have changed. So that is actually a positive in terms of making our case for ASM and why 
it's a it's a viable thing. Um, uh, I want to point out a couple things about control and why am I here and I don't have any shares and how come I'm the CEO. Well, look, I'm going to be real straight with you. Um, it's my concept, okay? I, I, the ones who got bags, uh, the goodie bags, see the drawings there. Um, I wrote the thing. I, I wrote the design. I gave Ace the instructions. And I was the default director as a result of that only because we were through the, going through the development and, and nobody, when we were in Costa Rica, nobody wanted to be publicly known. I mean, I, it was, nobody want, I tried many times to for, form a board of directors and everybody was totally happy with me being the guy out front and being the only guy on there because they didn't want the risk. They wanted the upside but not the downside which is something I've come to understand a lot more clearly uh, in the last 10 years <laughs> than I did before, um, the way people think about these things. But that's why there was no board, and that's why I was the sole director. So, of course, when the crash happened, um, you know, that was definitely not going to happen. There was never going to be a, you know, they were perfectly fine to let everything collapse on my head because, um, you know, why, why? <laughs> Why have any part in that, right? So that has continued. That the fact that I'm the sole director has continued through the through Costa Rica, through the crash, and then through the relaunch. So it's it's amazing to me that people think now it's okay to come along and try to grab power or try to take control when things are headed in the right direction. Well, that's not how it works. Okay, that's not how things work. It's not how it's going to work. Succession of power was established. Actually, when I met Alper in Costa Rica, I knew he was going to be, be uh, my successor. Um, that has not changed. That's more than a decade. Now he's in Los Angeles. He's going to be, he's got a job and all that. We talked about timelines and all that. This, uh, this business has to get real and real funding and be able to support a real salary commensurate with his abilities. Uh, and he can't do that until we bring, bring in the outside money and the outside help. So... I stand in this role uh, until the, the power is handed to him, and there is no exceptions to that. That's how it will be. Um, that was agreed more than a decade ago. It's not going to change. So it's a waste of time and frustration of yourself to think that it's going to be different. Okay, And I will always be in the background um, helping uh, Alper guide through, the, through things, but he will be the front man when it's time, period. And there's nobody in between. It's between me and then Alper. Um, as far as the stock goes, I had to trade away, give away, um, otherwise consume all of my personal stake other than a little bit that I gave to my kids and some to my ex-wife and a couple friends. I had to get rid of all of it to keep us funded. I could only trade with what I had in my hand, which was my own stake, and that's what I used to uh, keep us moving through the darkness, basically, and even all the way up until not too long ago. So, but that's, that has nothing to do with directorship. Those things are separate. The stock as it stands, um, there are no voting rights attached to that stock yet. Um, so it doesn't matter how many shares there are or how many people get together and try to throw me out. Uh, first of all, shame on you for even thinking that. Um, you know, you want to have an, you're not even going to have an Apple computer if you take the Steve Jobs out of it before it becomes an Apple computer, okay? And learn lessons from this. When when Steve Jobs was removed from Apple, Apple, I was in the computer business when that happened, and Apple came very, very, very close to death as a result of that. Um, so I'm the creator of the idea. I am. I have actually had to take on liabilities and debts, and I still do to this day. I don't get a quote salary, so disabuse yourself of that notion. Um, all that happens is that my debt service, which is mainly loaded up with ASM things at any given time between twenty and thirty thousand dollars, that's all. That's my quote pay. Okay, I don't have any hobbies. I don't do anything but study, develop materials, travel, talk to people, uh, everything to advance ASM. There is nothing else. My kids are grown. Um, this is all I do. So, and I don't draw. Uh, I mean, you can see my personal tax returns. My average income is about thirty-five hundred to four thousand dollars a month before expenses, and you need twelve hundred. I mean, my rent is twelve hundred and fifty dollars by itself. Okay, so 
this is not some kind of income operation for me. This is purely stay alive, keep moving the, the mission ahead and, and, and get it finished. Um, so there is no big payoff, payday, you know, happily ever after, uh, buy a Lamborghini from, from North Hollywood. That's not the end game here because my stake is gone. And, and what part of it is would probably be my claim that's left was, was granted to the nonprofit so the nonprofit can have operating money, um, basically an endless bank account to execute the mission, not have to go out and raise money anymore and do the social side, which is where my interest is. And then I'll draw a salary from there, but it will only be uh, what's, I mean, first of all, it's got, governed by IRS guidelines. But I don't even think I'll take it that far because I just, I'm, that's not my motivation. My motivation is not to draw. I, I have had the fortunate experience of being a successful businessman several, in several different things early. And I know what it's like to buy and sell things and all that stuff. And it's, uh, it's not my mo motivation. It has no draw for me. But what does have a draw for me is making a difference. And, I, um, and I'm going to get to that. And that's going to be my close here. So... Why, why do I care about this and why am I so committed to it, willing to put up with so much garbage and um, liabilities and, and grief and setbacks and all that stuff? So yeah, let me address that just for a second. Yes, it's, um, it's, it's disappointing that the, the Form 1 was kicked back, but I fully expected there would be uh, numerous rounds of this kind of thing. And if you do any research on um, any government process like that, you're, it's all public. You're going to see back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes they puke the whole thing back. Sometimes they kick back a part of it. What we did get out of that is new direction that I think that is going to work faster and easier for us than the path that we were on, which is um, registering as a um, ATS, Alternative Trading System, which is kind of a half step between here and a uh, fully um, regulated national exchange. So that's the process we're going through internally to reformat and figure out what's missing. There are some parts that we can buy that we don't have to duplicate, like the broker-dealer stuff. We found out that there's actually on-the-shelf uh, companies you can buy and attach. So we're working through all that stuff. So um, it's not as big of a deal as it seems. Um, having dealt with lots of interactions with government forms and government processes, this is pretty normal stuff. Um, you, if, you, if you've not done that, then you're going to see it as a bigger thing than it is. Um, even just look at our patent prosecutions and those kinds of things. I mean, it's just a lot of back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, so this is normal. Um, it really is. Do your homework and you'll see it's the case. So finally, why do I care about this? Um, in the process of living in Costa Rica, uh, or while I was living in Costa Rica, I really saw for the first time what poverty looks like. Now, Costa Rica is poor, but it's not as poor as they get by any means down there in that country. It's kind of like the United States of that region. But it was enough to shock me and, and get me looking, thinking about why, uh, why is there so much disparity. And, and in that country, you see, it, you see it starkly. I mean, you see people living in $200,000 condos on one side of the freeway and people living on the other side of the freeway that are about to slide down into the, into the gully. That's what we call it in Louisiana, <laughs> into a ditch, into a big ditch. And it's just shocking to me, and I went looking for the reason why, and it turns into opportunity, economic opportunity. They just don't have it, and they don't know where to get it, and there's nobody trying to get it for them. So... Um, sports is, is pervasive, sports is, um, you know, it's universal, and it's accessible now through, through your mobile phone and all that. So that wasn't the case when we started, but that's the case now. So the thesis is, and the, what drives me, other than, of course, um, I didn't want to lose the original investor's money from prior to the crash. That was a big motivator to not give up. Um, still is, and st every day to see it through that's the, the stick. The carrot is, for me, is that this uh, concept of sports as an asset class will fundamentally change the world economy. It will produce a new category of assets and that category will spin off all sorts of uh, industries and things and not just confined to the Western world, to the US, but it will go everywhere. And 
and you know even the poorest countries in the world have soccer teams and you know all you need is a ball you can you can kick a ball around in the dust and you have a soccer game so um, and mobile phone access uh, is smartphone access will be universal soon enough I mean it will literally be every person on the planet will either have one or have access to one so that the tool is the distribution tool is already in the hands of the customer the demand is already there so it's create a new fuel for the economy uh, and then that becomes a job creator and then that will in our view will begin to fill in that vast middle um, the great middle where where it, there, we're ending up in a world where there's going to be rich people and serfs that's basically all you're going to have if something doesn't change and sports as an asset class is a big enough idea that uh, it can bridge that gap and I'm actually putting together those proofs because that's going to become a bigger and bigger part of the story uh, and I think it's important so uh, where we are right now right now is um, is going through the process of lead generation and response in terms of the investment and that is a that's a process it's not an instant process um, I have personally talk to people who do this for a living and disabuse yourself of the notion that somebody hears a great idea on the back of a napkin and writes you a check that is a fantasy it's like Hollywood just get on the bus and come over here and you're gonna be rich and famous that is a lie it's a very well told lie it's designed to keep the dream alive same thing is true in Silicon Valley absolutely the same thing the bottom line is it's really hard to raise money um, you're competing against everybody else in the marketplace that's looking for money. It's not just the idea, it's the personalities, it's the timing. It's, but what you have to do is you have to continuously talk, you have to continuously meet new people, and that takes time, and that process has started. I've had several meetings um, last month, and I have more coming, and I have more introductions coming, but it's not an instant process. Uh, it's going to take some time, and, in, and during that time, we have to continue. Um, you know, we have to continue, otherwise we lose what we have. So um, it's important that you know when I put out a call for help that it's it's it comes. You know, I'm doing the best I can to structure it in a way that is reasonable and beneficial, and it's not just throwing money down a hole. But at the bottom, you know, at the end of the day, um, I have to keep the lights on until I get in, you know work my way through all these leads and get by, you know get takers, get people that say yes and write the check and then you know it, once we get this round finished the, and we public publicly announce it I'm confident that things will uh, will change vastly for us it will be a, a night and day transition but until that day we have to continue to march you know you don't or you know if you don't use the moon scenario you don't get three quarters of the way to the moon you either get to the moon or you perish uh, there's nothing in the middle so that's where we are. We need to keep moving and keep keep our bills paid. And I need to keep doing what I'm doing to bring the bring the funding in. And nobody wants to talk to anybody else. They don't want to talk to Zach. They don't want to talk to Ace. They want to they want to talk to the person that came up with it. And they want to look in my eyes and they want to see if they can believe me or not. That's where it starts. Okay. It's that's even before the proposition and everything else. Who is this person? And do I believe them? That's number one. Okay. And they always want the founders. They don't. They don't. They don't want the. They don't want the, the hired hands. We actually tried that in the past and it failed. So it has to be me that does this. Um, so anyway, that's where we stand. Um, thank you for taking some time on your Saturday morning, and um, you know, just know that there, are, the whole team uh, is working very diligently. I work on this every single day, um, no exceptions. Uh, maybe every once in a while, you know, take a few hours off on a Sunday. Or a Saturday to go drive around for a while but the rest of the time is dug in to figuring out the answers to all these things and and making ASM work um, again on the timeline I don't buy uh, the criticisms about it's taking too long um, there is no other sports stock market in the marketplace it's been tried three or four times at least a hundred million dollars has been thrown at it and lost um, it's not easy. If it was, it would have been done already. If there was an option that could work, uh, it would be out there. Um, I would say, you know, if you want to draw a fair timeline, it's five years to this moment, um, which means if you look at the timeline for, quote, big ideas, that's 
closer to the truth in terms of what really happens when you have something that works and you go out to the marketplace for funding. So um, that's where we stand and that's what we're doing. So um, again, thanks for your Saturday morning and um, I will speak with you again soon. Bye.